mean, the COVID thing, I mean, think about our homeless population here in LA. If this thing was anywhere remotely close yeah. to what they've said this sucker is that, that that homeless population would be wiped out what's up guys welcome back to the one percenter podcast i am excited for today both of us are we have an awesome guest for you today he's a former former nfl player he's doing amazing things with this company called built ready guys this, this man is just it's going to impact you a lot guys welcome heath evans you didn't say though he's sold us a lot too i mean like he's daughters. Yeah, with two daughters, you got to stay strong. People are like, you've been retired for like nine years. Why are you staying so jacked? I'm like, have you seen my daughters? I'm like, the boys come to my house. I'm answering the door in my underwear and be like, what? What y'all want? <laughs> oh, man. I saw that one, uh, that 225 bench press you did. I, I pipped, popped up on my feed. You did like what? Like 40, 50? I saw that. Like that. But, but he, he wasn't like in his a suit. suit. Yeah. Like he wasn't in his suit. Like, I'm going like he was in that dress shirt, man. Hey, like, uh, yeah. So back in my NFL Network days, the NFL Combine every February, all the college guys trying to get into the NFL do a 225 rep test, uh, test muscular endurance, strength, et cetera, et cetera. So the NFL Network had an idea of like, hey, why don't we put you up there in a suit and tie? We'll do it live on air. Uh, and so a couple of years in a row, I was able to, to show the young bucks uh, what it's all about. So the last time I got 45, I couldn't knock out 46, and Michael Hearn's still giving me crap for not getting 50. So it, it is what it is, you know? I love it, man. Well, so he he played in the NFL for not 10 years, was it? 10 years. 10 years. So you played at the Dolphins, you played at the Saints, the Patriots, and the Seahawks, right? Yes, sir. Awesome, man. So talk to us a little bit a little bit about that. Like, that's, that's so many kids' dream is to play in the NFL and everything. So talk to me about how you knew football was for you and then the journey of getting into the NFL. Woo, loaded question. Four years old. I'm like, Dad, I'm going to play in the NFL. I mean, my dad was the most encouraging, loving dad you could get, ex-Marine. So he had this balance of, like, tough love and, like, when you say masculinity, like the masculinity that, that you love and, and, and respect. But he also had this, this nurturing side. So, you know, as time goes on, you get to eight. I keep running my mouth. I'm going to the NFL. About 14, he sat me down. He said, son, if you're serious about this, I, I'd be a horrible dad if I didn't help you chase your dreams and help you set goals uh, to get to where you want to go. And so he literally made me sign a contract um, that I was going to do whatever he told me to do. He said, are you serious? Are you going to be a man of your word? Because if you are, at 14, you're going to sign your name. And we're going to run. We're going to work out. We're going to eat. We're going to sleep. And we're going to ignore the noise. We're going to avoid the girlfriends. We're going to do what it takes to, to not survive. I but to run. I love that. Yeah. So it started there. I mean, I was the, the chubby, fat white boy from Palm Beach, Florida, that had no business being in the NFL. Um, but through great fatherhood, uh, which I'm sure that topic will, will probably come up out of my mouth quite a bit because I think it's, it's, it's lacking in, in today's society and it's showing up in so many different ways. Um, but hard work, discipline, all the guests that you guys have on this podcast, they're, they're preaching the same thing. It might come from different methodologies, but I got something on the back of my, my hoodie that said hard work works. I told my daughter last night, laying in bed, praying, reading our Bible. Anywhere we want to go, you ain't getting there without hard work if it's going to be some level of success. If it's going to do something that's great, you better be, you better be prepared to, to put the blood, sweat, and tears in. And, and I mean the tears because any man or woman of great success, they've had their nights of tears. Yeah, so, so I'm sure tons of people laughed at you. Tons of people were like, Heath, what are you, what are you talking about? You're not going to the NFL. How, how was that like, man? Like, like you just said, you had no business being there. But what was, what was that journey like? Listen, I think we're born with temperament, but I also think temperament is created. There's this battle of nature versus nurture. I think it's both. I think the God of the universe just says, hey, Sam, here's your giftedness. Ephesians 2 talks about God's created all of us for good works. Yeah. And then it's up, us for us to kind of lead a life that says, all right, I don't know what's happening tomorrow, but I'm trying to find out what these good works are that God has for me so I don't waste my freaking life. And so I think... I had some grit and determination that God just built in me from day one, but I was also raised with a tough mom and dad. I mean, you hear a funny story in high school, you turn on my high school tape and you don't hear my dad yelling and screaming. You'd look up in the stands and there'd be like this five yard radius around my mom where no one was sitting with her. She's yelling and screaming, Sam, if I, if I laid on the ground for two seconds after I got tackled, Get up, Heath. You're not hurt. What are you doing? Get up. That's my mom. So 
I grew up with some crazy tough love. So I think the, the naysayers, I remember one of my best friends, Jody Kidd, he would always tell, you ain't going, you, you, you're not going to be all state. You're not going to do this. And you're not getting your, your Florida State scholarship. You're not this. And it would just, it would stir in me. But I think without mom and dad, it probably would have broke me at some point in time. I can't tell you how many college coaches, oh, you're not the right skin color. Now, in this day and age of all the stuff that were going on, you know, worldwide or nationwide, that's kind of opposite. But in the game of football, white boys don't play running back. It's, oh, you don't, you don't look like what, what we want. I'm, oh, okay. Well, let's run a 40, and let's put me on the field, and let's put some pads on, and let's see if I look like what you want then. So um, there was constant setbacks, but that mindset that I believe some was God-given, and then other was just nurtured into me of like, boy, you better not quit. Losers quit. You ask Ava and Naomi, 16 and 13, Evans don't quit. We might fail, and we might fail a bunch, but we don't quit. And so I think there was some, God made me a little special. Anyone that knows me, I've got a few screws loose. Um, but, but at the end of the day, mom and dad raised me hard and raised me right. Yeah. So you went to Auburn, right? Yeah. So talk to us about what it started to feel like when, when your dream actually started to materialize. And you thought, hey, I might actually be able to do this. Oh, I, I was the only one that, that thought I might actually be able to do this. My, my college career was so funny. My freshman year, um, I, I signed under Terry Bowden, the great Bobby Bowden's son. He got fired after my freshman year. My freshman year, I played three games, actually scored a couple touchdowns, did really well, but broke my ankle, sat for the next six games. I told you I had a few screw loose. I, I had a plate and eight screws put in my ankle. Everyone said that my season was done. I'm like, no, 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 I'll be back for Georgia and Alabama at the end of the year. I did, got back, scored another touchdown, played pretty well. We got our heads kicked in on both those games, so we won't talk about that. Um, but then my coach got fired. And so then another coach comes in, um, and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't like me. He doesn't want a, a, a big, white, 250-pound running back. He doesn't use a fullback. Uh, my whole skill set kind of went out the window, um, and I sat the majority of my sophomore year. I was told I wasn't good enough. I actually was moved to defensive line in the SEC. So at about 240 pounds at that time, because I tried to lose weight to give them more of the running back that they wanted, they moved me to defensive line, um, and I'm getting mauled in the SEC, playing 330-pound offensive linemen. So I play a good little bit my junior year, and then I decide to leave early for the NFL because I wasn't going to play anymore at Auburn because they didn't want me there. So when you look at my college statistical years, um, they're – I didn't have a lot of time on the field. I didn't have a lot of, oh, look, this is the best fullback in the country. Now, the scouts were saying that, but most people were wondering why, why isn't this kid playing more? So I ended up being the first fullback drafted in the 2001 draft. But that's a God story in and of itself because um, <laughs> if you look at the amount of time I played and the, and the persecution I faced and, and all the, the pushback that I got to actually try to do Play my talents and ability. It, it wasn't much. Hey, so, it doesn't um, add up. It, it doesn't add up. You know, you, it, it really, it really doesn't. It, it, in so many ways, and honestly, ten years in the NFL, you, you could say say that too. You know, between injuries and different setbacks and pushbacks. But there's a lot of cool stories, and there's a lot of grit and a lot of determination, and just a, a lot of what I believe the favor of God on, on my life in, in different areas. So, um, yeah, Auburn. Uh, to say was full of tests and trials would be an understatement. There was nothing easy about my college career. I will add this, and then I'll shut up on this point. Middle of my sophomore year, um, you know, when, when I wasn't playing, and I was literally riding the bench. I'd been freshman all everything. Um, people like, oh, you, where are you going to transfer to? Where are you going to go? I'm like, I'm not quitting. I'm not transferring. I'm going to stay right here for two reasons. A, I believe God put me here. So I ain't going to shortchange what he's got for me. But two, losers quit. These coaches say I'm not good enough to play here. I will stay and I will fight until I prove them wrong. Now, maybe I wouldn't have been good enough, but I never would have known if I would have tapped out and gone somewhere else. And too many people, we tap out too soon. That that people call it a verge of a miracle. Some people don't believe in God, but, but, but just we keep knocking. And, and that's what I think real, real leaders do. There's a lot of failures. You talk to most millionaires, talk to a lot of people. They have a lot more death stories than they do life stories. But when they get to that life story, all those death stories become that much more powerful and encourage people to really to push through the, the tough times of life. Yeah. I love that. I mean, yeah. he, 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 he lived it, yeah. you know, he knows it for yeah. sure. So yeah. I'm curious because as, as a kid, I, I had that dream. I wanted to play professional soccer and everything like that. 
So what was that feeling on draft night? <laughs> Man, it's uh, – I remember I was in Auburn, Alabama, and I, I got the call. My phone rang, but New Orleans Saints were on the clock. And so I'm thinking, oh, Palm Beach, Florida to New Orleans, that's not far. That's a quick light, the quick flight for mom and dad and the family. Like, this is going to be great. Pete, this is Mike Holmgren. I'm like, who? <laughs> it was the Seattle Seahawks. So I went from thinking West Palm Beach, Florida, at the bottom of Florida to New Orleans, which, you know, a 45-minute flight, all the way to the top of the Northwest in Seattle, Washington. Couldn't get me further away from home. Um, to say I was excited after I was surprised and kind of like heart shook a little bit because I thought it was the New Orleans Saints calling and not the, the Seattle Seahawks, um, it, it, was, it was just one step closer. I was much more excited on opening day my rookie year being out there on the kickoff team and looking around and, and just seeing a, a massive NFL stadium field. You know, I'd been in the SEC stadiums where you got 106,000 people and it's crazy and rabid fans. Um, but there was something about strapping on that Seattle Seahawks NFL helmet and knowing that and it's to say I had flashbacks of like all the work I put in that'd be a lie I don't think that way it's not the way my brain works but I remember that week of the build-up of thinking like wow like this started when I was four running my mouth four years old that's what I was thinking you know eight years old. At, at eight years old me and pop started working out in the garage a little bit at 14 years old I had to sign my life away on a contract with my dad to to eat whatever he told me to eat to do the workouts to do the running um but it, but it was an amazing thing where you see literally a decade plus of, of time and energy and resources and financial sacrifice from mom and dad, my own, Gosh. kind of start to play into fruition. A beautiful, beautiful thing. It, it's think and grow rich your life. You know, I mean, the book, think, you know what I mean? You said it, you had the desire, you manifested it, and it, it, it came true. It's, it's like, I feel like I'm reading Think and Grow Rich right now. Yeah, I think, you know, it's like I've never read the book, but, but I think so many people in our day and age just stop with the, the positive thinking and they stop with the verbal affirmations of trying. But like if I had to like refresh history, you know how many people I asked for help? You know how many times I had to humble myself and be like, okay, hey, I know I'm not good enough now, but hey, older statesmen on my Auburn team, what can I do to get where you're at? Yeah. Hey, I know you don't like me, and I know you don't think I'm good enough to play here, but what is it that you're looking for in me that I can't give you right now? When I was the chubby white boy in Palm Beach, Florida at 13 that was, that was too slow to even play a running back position, I had to go to my, a guy in my church and say, hey, how do I get fast? I'll do anything. He told me exactly what to do. I went out and did it every single night, five nights a week, all through the summer, lost a whole bunch of body fat and got really, really fast. But I, but I had the, the humility process of asking for help, the humility process of being like, I'm not good enough. So many people just think it's just going to happen. I mean, there's so many things in my life right now, even in Built Ready, I've got no answers for. But yet I look back after, you know, about six months now, and I see God just kind of put things in place. And they've been timely and stressful, and I'm like asking for help and can't find the right help. But all that stuff's purposeful too. And so I'm kind of in some ways back to square one when I was at 14. I'm, you can call me an entrepreneur, but I'm not. I'm a ball player that loved talking about football on NFL Network. That career was ended, and now we're moving into to what's next in my life. But the humility process is, is much more powerful than, oh, let me name it and claim it and speak it and believe it. There's a whole lot of people that speak and believe a lot of BS that ain't ever going to happen. Yeah. You know? And so we, we got we to gotta put in that humility grind work and just find a way. And I do believe that that human spirit is super powerful. I just want to help people chase the right things. Because Sam, you know, a lot of people get to the mountaintop and they want to put a gun in their mouth because they were chasing all the wrong stuff. They thought that would make me happy. Oh, this career. Oh, this financial bank account. Oh, this house. Oh, this car. Oh, this wife. Oh, I just need three healthy kids. Whatever it is, and, and this stuff just doesn't satisfy. So my, my heartbeat is to encourage men to, to chase things that, that, that matter. And, and that fulfill us and that give us peace and power. Yeah, man. I mean, so I, I love it, man, because I, I see the passion in you and, and I, I see it on your Instagram stories. I see how much you actually care and how much you want to change for, for these guys, you know, because especially today, there's so many men that I've seen that, that, that need it and they don't know. You know, I remember we had Sean Whalen on the podcast a while ago and he was talking about men are liars and men don't face those truths within themselves. And I, guys like you are out there 
sharing that message and helping them, man. So what are, what are some of those core principles and, and beliefs that you have that, that you don't see enough of today? Well, I mean, num- number four with Built Ready is we are transparent. Listen, the humility process of asking for help with business is one thing. The humility process of, of asking for help with the skeletons in our closet as, is, as men is a whole different side of strength and power. And, and very few men are willing to do it. You know, one of my favorite Bible verses talks about that, that you know, through our confession of one to another, the Bible says sins, but, but I believe that even as, as we get together as men and we just confess out of our mouths our, our weaknesses, our struggle points, what we're insecure about, what we're fearful about, where we went wrong, how we failed, there's healing that can set in. There's power that can take place by, by just getting the ickiness and the shame off our chest. And listen, um, to say I've stepped in a lot of crap in life, despite the great upbringing I have or had, would be an understatement. Um, but even in those sinful seasons, in those poor choice seasons that had disastrous consequences, now I can look back and say, man, I've suffered things so that I can comfort others, specifically men. And so, you know, number four is we are transparent, you know. Um, number five is we are accountable. I think those two things, people love saying I'm, I'm accountable in this area of my life, but they won't open up their full area for accountability. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very careful who I let speak into my life, you know, but I was on the phone yesterday for an hour and a half with, with one of my older mentors um, that has full reign and authority over how I'm parenting, um, how I'm trying to lead, how I'm trying to love, who I'll marry literally everything. And so, because I've, I've, I've become this open book really for any man that, that I come across, because I believe that in our transparency, there's power, not just for me, but there's healing for others. And so um, those are probably two of the biggest core principles that I think all the other principles of my life are, are based off of. Yeah. What, what do you think gets men to that point though, that like their life is in despair and they're, and they, and they need to, to find something like that. What do you think gets them to that low point? I mean, we call it brokenness. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> I, I, I have been so blessed to have so many amazing teammates and, and friends. And, and in every different walk of life, you know, I've got some of the most powerful CEOs in the world as people that I can dial up and they, they'd open up their house. They, they'd raise my kids if I died today. Um, but yet I see them struggle. They have billions with a B, you know, they, they have the beautiful bride, they have the gorgeous homes, they have everything this world says they need to be happy and peaceful. And yet they're the most unrestful, unpeaceful people in the world. Yeah. My boy Deion Sanders talks about the night he won his first Super Bowl, and he thought that was it. You know, he grew up in South Florida. Uh, you know, he's, he's way older than me. If you ever run into Dion, tell him I said he's way older than me. Um, but he tells this, he tells this story that, you know, he, he chased, you know, these dreams of high school state championships and then, you know, national championships at Florida state and then first round draft picks and then all the women and all the cars and all the stuff. And Joker wins his first Super Bowl, holding up his Lombardi. And he talks about driving his Lamborghini, thinking about driving his Lamborghini off a cliff that night because he was so broken. He was in so despair that he had chased all these things that just never really satisfied his soul. And yet he had everything. I mean, listen, you're going to be hard pressed to find a a guy that's um, had more fame and accolades and worldly pleasures thrown his way than Deion Sanders Uh from white girls to black girls, to millionaire deals, to baseball contracts, to football contracts, to TV contracts. He's still one of the biggest names in the NFL analyst space right now. Um, But yet he was broken. And so Dion, if he was sitting right here next to us, we'd probably be sharing a donut together. Uh, but but he'd, he'd tell you that Jesus was the one that rescued his soul, you know? Um, and so I can go on with story after story. I mean, um, Tom Brady is the most phenomenal leader I've ever been around in all my life. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the interview so far. You know, one of the keys to my success has always been productivity and time management. And now I have a video for you so how you can increase your productivity and really, really start getting stuff done. So click somewhere below here and message me the the word time. I'm going to send you my free video training so you can take your productivity to the next level. Now let's get back to the interview. Um, And 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 that's, listen, Bill Belichick is is 1B. 
but there is a humility to Tom Brady that sets him apart from anyone else I've ever been around. He's willing to take backlash. He's willing to stand in the midst of bullets being thrown at him and fired at him. You name it. His ability to jump in your crap when you fail the team, not because you failed him, but because you failed the team. And then his ability to, to love you up and make you feel like the greatest man in the world, um, his ability to, to plan out his day in such a way where he can really love and serve his football team, not for him, but so that the team can thrive. But yet in 2005, you know, this, this man sits in front of the world on 60 Minutes and says, if money and women and Super Bowl rings are all this world has to offer, I'm in trouble because I'm not happy. And so you ask Tom Brady to this day, what's his favorite ring? He's going to tell you the next one. Stuff in this world just doesn't satisfy. And so as men, um, what gets us to the point where we kind of throw in the towel? I, I know for me, I don't really have a lot of explanation. I just feel like God's rescue mission in my life just clicked in. And so I, anyone that's getting to know me, I, I am, I'm never going to take credit for anything in my life. I'm going to give God honor and glory or I'm going to praise mom and dad. I'm going to praise my mentor. I'm going to praise Ava and Naomi for just being loving daughters that helped kind of push my heart in the right directions. Cause if it wasn't for them, yeah. there'd be a lot of times I would have fallen short. Yeah. Um, so I, I am, I just think that that brokenness phase where we kind of just throw in the towel and cry out to mercy for God. I believe it's all on God's shoulders. And I believe scripture speaks to that, that he has a, he, he just, he does the rescuing. You know, but I feel for men, um, I feel for what the, the real worldly successful men. And I'll, I'll say this, I know I ramble, but let me finish with this. I was in a room of 106 of the most powerful real estate people in the world a few months back. And I was, I was honestly scared for one of the first times ever because I was brought there, Sam, to, to do teamwork, to speak about all the stuff that I've spoken about, about Top Golf and Chick-fil-A and being a part of the Patriots and knowing all these big CEO billionaire owners and all the leadership stuff that I've learned and all the teamwork stuff that I've learned. And yet I knew God, God had a different message for this room. And listen, this, this wasn't a church meeting. This was a business meeting. Someone like Sam had hired me to come in there and share practical application points that these business monsters could take back to their businesses, apply to their team and make money. That's why I was there. Um, and yet God, I, I knew God was, telling me to share a different message. And, and I literally got up there and I asked this group of power, power players in the real estate space, people that are selling literally some of them 50,000 homes a year. Like they are crushing it. Um, the first or second most powerful real estate mind in, in the world was in the room. He had just spoken before I had. I was closing this event out. Why would they would have me close this event out? I don't know. I just think God set it up that way. But I asked this room, I kind of set the stage of what real happiness and what real success is. And then I asked him, I said, who's happy and who's truly successful? Maybe 20 raised their hands. These were all multimillionaires. These were all people. And it was a very somber room after that. But I was able to pour into them a message of not just power, but a message of peace. Because I can give people practical applications how to take Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, Sean Payton, Mike Holmgren, leadership principles, apply them to their business and they will make money hand over fist every single time. They will have power to have worldly success and lack the peace that I desire for people to have. And so when our mindset is off and when we're chasing the wrong things, the human mind and spirit is so strong a lot of times we're going to get all those things and be more miserable the higher we chase that so-called success ladder. Yeah. And so I have just said, God, my message is I want men to be peaceful and powerful. Yeah. I want men to have impact for all of eternity. I mean, the Bible talks about our life is literally a breath. And we focus so much on the here and now, on our temporary sufferings, our temporary bank account. We're not taking any of this crap with us. And so um, my message isn't the most popular, but my message has peace and power, not just power. Um, I love that. I love that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a much needed message this, this day and age. Like you said, there's so many people that are, um, that, that, that are wealthy 
or you know they have plenty of money but they don't have peace mm. you know and um i never thought i would say that but i've been there you know but i've been there you know because i thought you know coming you know getting the mansion getting the cars you know you know having the businesses having millions and stuff like that having the watches all that kind of stuff i thought that was it and when you talk about you know uh deon sanders you know you know, winning the Super Bowl and having everything and wanting to drive his Lamborghini off a cliff. You know, I was I was never that, but it was points in my life, you know, that I look back and like, is this it? There's got to be something. There's got to be. has got to be something else. And I, but I thought being here now was was the answer, and it's not. Yeah, I I think it sounds so cliche until I kind of try to fill in the gaps. And again, I. This ain't my message. I've stolen everything that I'm sharing today, either from the Bible or the great leaders I've been around um, or stuff that I've learned the hard way. But you know, we were built to love and we were built to submit. And those are one word we love. The human you know, race loves the word love. We all want to be loved. But we're sucky at loving people. And so what I figured out more so in the last two years of life is that the more I submit my will and my wants and, and my ideas, I've said earlier, I don't know what's happening tomorrow. I mean, if we, if we rewound the videotape of America four months to think that we'd ever quarantine the healthy in America, people would have been like, Heath, you're crazy. You're nuts. That'll never happen. To say that uh, in certain states, you're not allowed to have church and you're not allowed to worship out loud. Oh, he, we're, we're a land built on religious freedoms. That will never happen. I had that very conversation in this house. Someone laughed at me when I said it was coming. It wasn't 24 hours later, and our governor out here said, oh, no, no, you can't worship in church. We'll praise the protesting. We'll praise the rioting. Have thousands, but you can't have more than 10 in church, and don't you dare open your mouth and sing. And so my, my, my thought is I have no clue what's coming tomorrow. I've got no clue. I don't know if I'm going to get my next breath, but I know who does. And so when my life gets humbly submitted before him, I start to see how much he loves me. Despite being the past adulterer, despite being prideful, despite being arrogant, despite being a, a, a short tempered dad at times, despite falling short as a leader, my list of failures could go on and on and on. But yet this God of the Bible is massively in love with Heath Evans for some reason. Like so wicked, so off the, the, the standard of, of, of God, but yet I just love you. And not only does he love me, he wants to bless me. And so then when I start figuring out this love, that he loves me, I can't help but love him. And then when someone wrongs me, I'm like, oh, well, I wronged God, so how could I not forgive them? How could I not love them? And so when I start being equipped to love people back, then I start feeling really loved by those who love me. People are lacking love and, and we're blaming everyone else around us. I used to blame a lot of people. I've been in relationships where I just, I just don't feel loved. I just, this, this is you and this is this. And then it led me astray to seek uh, an innate desire that God gave me in, in worldly ways. And then it just broke me even more. And not only did it break me, it broke my ex-wife. It broke pieces of my daughter's hearts. It broke my family. It, it hurt people. But yet God says, like, Heath, I, Heath, I love you, but, but you got you to submit to my way, and then you're going to see how much I love you, and then you're going to be able to love people in ways that you never dreamed of, and then you're going to feel so much love and acceptance. And so this world has things backwards. And so um, the, the submission has to come before love. It's the picture of a marriage. When, when me as a, a future husband will literally lay down my life to do what God's asked me to do, I'm going to serve my wife like Jesus served his people. I'm going to wash their feet, no matter what they do to him. And so we're looking at all the wrong things through lenses of how we see things here on earth, and we wonder why we're falling short. We wonder why we, we don't lack peace. We wonder why we get everything we ever wanted, but we got to drink ourselves to sleep at night. But we're wondering why this beautiful woman that seems to love me, why does she never satisfy? Because the Bible said that she couldn't, and God made it that way. So when we find satisfaction in God, I find peace and I find love. And then I'm able to share that love. Not perfectly. I fail all the time. But when I realize how much God loves me, it equips me to be able to love others, to forgive others, to, to love the unlovable. And then it's amazing how loved I start feeling. Because God's love is the most powerful, peaceful thing we could ever want. 
but we don't get to experience it without giving him our lives. We, we just want all his blessings. I was literally reading this morning in first Peter. It's a, it's a part of the scripture that nobody ever wants to talk about that, that God's favor is on his people. They love God's blessing is on his people, but his face is literally against the evildoers. So as long as I'm like, no, God, I'm doing it my way. God's like, okay, I love you, but, but I'm, I'm not going to bless your life. I'm not going to give you the rewards of peace and power. And so it's not my message. It's an unpopular message, but I, I, will, I will die on this message. And it's the message that Built Ready is built on. It's the message that um, I know no matter what season of life allows me to put my head on a pillow at night and peacefully rest. Yeah. Because I, I'm not in control, nor do I want to be in control. And you two definitely don't want me being in control. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's a couple of things. Like I remember I heard, I heard this one uh, pastor say, um, he said when his dad, when his dad was a kid and everything, and he, he was an amazing piano player, amazing piano player. And then when he grew up, he, he, he followed in his footsteps and everything. And he had this recital and, and he was trying to, he was, he was trying to play and everything. And he had his note to play and his dad's job was to make the song sound beautiful. It didn't matter if he messed up. It didn't matter if he played the wrong note, but his dad's job was to make this everything work. And, and there's something so peaceful about not being in control. There's something so peaceful. Dude, I could screw up, but my life is not going to be a result of my screw up. And there's something just so amazing about, about it not being up to me. And all you have to do is, is play your note and let him take care of everything else. You know, it, like, it's such a weight off of your shoulders that, that, that when you surrender, it, everything changes for the better. Everything yeah. changes for the better. Well, and, and that's and that's the the beauty of the Bible. It's a book yeah. of a whole bunch of screw ups, yeah. and it's a book that we make about us, when really the whole thing is about God's goodness and love. Yeah. Like any Bible character you want to pull out, they were a wreck. Like at one point in time, they were an absolute disaster, train wreck, and and yet God, okay, watch this, and then you watch their lives shift in faith. Because they, they submitted. And some looked very different. You know, some people's lives, Samson, the thief on the cross next to Jesus, their lives weren't radically changed until that last day when they turned to Jesus. Others, like the Apostle Paul, this joke was out murdering God's people. And then God does the work, Paul submits, and then his life was a blessing to Christians literally a thousand generations later. You know, and so... Um, that's, that's the beauty of submission and, and just when we hit those broken places of God allowing us to get to a point where we just cry out for mercy, um, it's the most beautiful place I've ever been placed in. Yeah. How, how has that affected you as, as a father? You know, because I know that that's incredible. That's one of the most yeah. important things to Sam is being a father and being with his family. And I know you're the same way. So how, is, how has that affected you when you raise your daughters? Well, I've got my beautiful 13-year-old Naomi sitting over here in the corner. Um, sometimes they love it, and sometimes they hate it. Um, the message of Jesus is tough. We, we think we have this idea of what love is, and so there is this love being preached, I think, in churches today that it's not the love of God. Jesus himself said that he didn't come to bring peace. He literally came to, to divide. Now, he came to unify his church. But, but my message of Jesus is a divisive one. My message of Jesus out of his own, own mouth said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one gets to God the Father except through me. That in alone, what do you mean? He's the only way. We're humans. We don't like to be, we like we like to have choices. We like to have our power influenced over it. So literally just two nights ago, you know, I was in there with my oldest, Ava, rubbing her back for probably 30, 35 minutes, listening to her. She was in a tough spot. No clue what to say to her. Begging God for wisdom, you know, rubbing her back. Um, as I'm leaving the room, I just felt like it was, hey, Heath, you've comforted her. You've tried your best human effort to show her human love and empathy and sympathy. But the truth is the only thing that will set my daughters free. And I have no power 
to control when that truth sets in their heart and changes their heart. As a God-fearing Christian man, my only objective is to obey God. And so I had to try to gently deliver a message that was full of hard truths. It wasn't accepted well, and it's created a little bit of division. But here's what I know about my two girls. They, they have hearts for God. They are in this human battle of, of life and doing it well and obedience and disobedience, just like I am. And what the word of God tells me about my covering as a righteous man over my children, not because I do anything righteous, but because Jesus made me righteous. Because of Jesus, I've been made right in the eyes of God. Listen, my, my, my screw-ups are on and on and on. The Bible says my best righteous works are filthy rags compared to Jesus. This is not about me. But because of what Jesus did in my life, I have a covering over my children for the time that they're in my home. And so I believe God is working and stirring in their hearts, even when I don't see it. In business, Sam, you know, sometimes we're trying to bust our butts. We don't know which end is up. We don't see anything good coming. And then, bam, it just breaks one day. That's the life of faith. We believe, we believe, we believe. We push, we push, we push. We stand on the truth. We stand on the truth. And then one day, God does the work. My only area of obedience is he share the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's in charge. That's very easy when I'm in a group of men like us because I want to love you guys. I want to serve you, but you're not my girls. And so taking faith with y'all's life is somewhat easy. God's got my boys. God's got to take care of them. When it comes to Ava and Naomi, it, it's, it eats at me. And, and, and then I'm like, okay, God, no, I'm going to give this burden back to you. No, 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 God, your word says I have to go back to truth. That's why Paul tells me, renew my mind every single day to meditate on the word of God, not just meditate, not just to go on some yoga session and meditate. That word has been polluted. Meditate came from meditate day and night, morning and night. That's what God's word said. Meditate on his word. So I renew my mind so that I can have peace and power that my daughters will ultimately see, not because of me, but because God's word says so. Yeah. What do you, what do you think you start? You know, cause, cause I, I, I love hearing you talk about this and I admire it because like, you can see it in you. Yeah. You know, if you're someone who, who doesn't have that, that strength in their faith and everything, where do you, how do you, how do you get that? How do you start? Um, a, that's all on God too, but start in Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right. It is the life of Jesus. Matthew's going to start with, you know, <laughs> the, the generations that came before him. But what you'll realize is Matthew starts just proving the validity of God. Because there's so many prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of the life to come of Jesus. And so if you read Matthew and, and the Holy Spirit gives you understanding, you're going to leave the book of Matthew with like, oh, God is the way. God knew all this from the beginning of time. He has purpose in my life and Jesus has a plan. And then when you start asking God, because here's the thing, you got to remember, Jesus' disciples walked with him for three plus years. One of them betrayed him. A couple of them didn't even really believe in him. The others believed but didn't really fully know who he was and what he was. But after that man died and was buried and raised again, those other 11 apostles, they were all willing to give their life for the man. Matter of fact, they all did. Some of them were hung upside down. Some of them were burned. Some of them were whatever. And that sounds crazy in this day and age. But those men, something so shifted because of, what Jesus and what the scripture had promised all through the Old Testament and the New Testament came to pass. And when those men, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God did the work. Those apostles were no different than the three of us. God, God shifted something in their life. They were able to humble themselves. They played their part in, 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 in walking with Jesus. I, don't, I hate to quantify because I just want all God to get all the glory. I want the life of Jesus to be glorified in my life. And so where you start, just start reading the Word of God, and God will do the rest. My, my daily prayer is, God, give me mercy to walk with you today. I know you hear my prayers. And so this Word, the Bible says that it's, it's a light unto my path. So the more I read it, my, my path is going to get brighter, and I'm going to know where to walk. But if I'm not reading it, I'm not going to know where to walk. I'm not going to know where to walk as a father. I'm not going to know where to walk with built ready. I'm not going to know where to walk with my, my boy Taylor sitting right here next to me. I'm not going to know where to walk when I go in the grocery store and I have some crazy conversation with some crazy lady. Like it just, it's a light into our path. And so I just, 
I've come to believe that the, the word of God for each and every word, and I've seen the power in its life, in my life. And so I want people to start in the word. There's a lot of good books. There's a lot of good churches. I want people to know the voice in the word of God, because that word is what changes our hearts and our minds. Jesus came as flesh. He is that word that our Bible, it's different than it's, it's different than any other religious book. The Bible says it's alive and active. And there's something supernaturally powerful when we read it. I was up in it this morning. I remember three or four verses of the hour plus I spent in it. But I know it will empower my life throughout the course of today. And so I'm going to start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those Gospels, the life of Jesus, and then get in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that is preaching Jesus. Um, start there. God will take care of the rest. Okay. I love it, man. And join Built Ready if you're a man. <laughs> exactly, man. Now, what, how do you, what, what do you think of everything that's, that's going on today? You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of controversies and I, and I know uh, you've, oh. you've been very vocal. Uh-oh. So I'm, I'm curious, what do you think? Not okay, boy. Let me, let me, let me discuss my seat. Okay, let's do this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest. My thoughts don't really matter. Yeah. Let's, let's talk, let's talk about um, George Floyd first. It's heartbreaking. I mean, it was murder. I mean, it was evil at every level. And I've seen a lot of different takes. People outside the church, people inside the church. Here's what I know. Racism is hatred. You know, hatred is evil. The only one that deals with evil is Jesus. And so I think when we get our eyes focused on the wrong thing, and I don't ever mean to demean anyone. And I'm not trying to belittle anyone's personal pain their personal history, their family's personal history, their generational line. For me to try to empathize, I try to. And I want to get in people's shoes. But the word of God even tells me that no one is ever going to experience my pain the way that I experience it. And so to some degree, me loving people, it's what I'm called to do. Me trying to empathize, it's what I'm called to do. But the word of God also tells me that when, when, when I go to my kids for comfort, they're never going to be able to fully comfort me, and God made it that way. When I went through my divorce and I was going to run to another woman, that woman was never going to be able to comfort me in the way that I wanted to. The Word of God tells me that. God made it so that I would always run to Him to fix my broken heart. And so in a world that's dealing with some racial stuff, I'm going to be really honest. I've got a brother sitting right next to me. I've had multiple others in my house in the last few months. When I was in Florida a few weeks ago, I had my twin Haitian brothers in the house. And I, I, I don't believe what the media sells us. I believe in an America. Um, yeah, do we have issues? Sure. Are there bad cops? Yeah. Are there responsibilities that need to be taken on the cop side as well as the African community side about African community um, uh, cities in, in different places that cops are on edge because of past crimes and offenses? Yeah. What do I blame it on? I blame it on people not submitting to the will of God. I blame it on fathers not being in the house. I watched Denzel Washington the other day just beautifully tear down. And again, these are my feelings. And this is Denzel Washington's feelings. All right? It's not the word of God. But I do believe a lot of it aligns with what God's truth speaks. We can talk about white privilege. We can talk about racism. We can talk about you know, 350, 400 plus years of, of racial divide. And there is a lot of truth. There's a lot of brokenness, a lot of sin, and a lot of shame. But what Denzel went at was two things. Personal responsibility, which the life of Jesus teaches us. He took on personal responsibility for the sins of the world to give us a picture that we would take on personal responsibility to say, okay, here's my sin, my junk, my failure, so I own it, not blame other people for it. But Denzel went a step, father, or a step further about his three best friends. And now he was the one that had a father in his home and the other three didn't. And that people blame it on the system. The system is set up against him. He said, my boys were in jail before the system ever had a chance to get them. And so he dug it down roots deeper and he took a lot of backlash. He took a lot of beating from the black community. You know, 
but there is, there's validity in his statement because God created a husband and wife to be together, to, to create kids, to be a team, to raise them together, to build up their identity and who they are. And so when you dive into the race stuff, we can go a thousand different directions. I just believe Jesus is the answer because Jesus was love. Jesus loved everyone he ever came in contact with and people murdered him. They hated him. They hated his message. And he was love. It's undeniable. He is love. And so here's the deal. I could rid the world of, of all racism. Every bit. And the racist white people and the racist black people and the racist Hispanics and the racist Asians, the people that were, that were being racist against other cultures, those people still wouldn't feel loved because their heart isn't in a position to feel loved. I can go on through relationship after relationship where I've been and where I've tried to love people they've never felt my love. And now I'm starting to see the glimpse of God's word come to life because if God doesn't heal, Sam, you and I could be best friends. I could serve you. I could take care of you. I could, you, you could be sick on your deathbed and then I could, I could be literally taking you to the bathroom and brushing your hair and brushing your teeth, serving you like no man could ever serve you. But if your heart is shattered and broken, if, yeah. you're sh- if your heart is anger, angry and bitter, you're never, ever going to feel my love and acceptance. I could, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus and Judas, Judas gave his life for Judas. And Judas is like, nah, screw you, playboy. I'm going to 30 pieces of silver. You kidding me? So Jesus' life proves that racism and, and fighting this sucker, all these different ways, isn't the answer. Are there good things that we need to do as a, as a community to come together and fight evil? Always, always. But the answer is Jesus. Um, in light of coronavirus, it doesn't add up. If, if masks are the, the answers and masks protect us and they, they do whatever, then why have I been allowed to wear my tank top over my ears for the last three months? How come everyone doesn't have to have the same mask? How come these numbers out of California and New York are so much crazy higher than everyone else? And they talk about population. Okay, Florida's population is, is, is a little bit more than that of New York's. And you look at the numbers, they don't add up. And so I, I believe there's evil underlying in absolutely every bit of this. Um, the CDC's new numbers. But listen, people want facts. They don't want my opinion. So let's just talk about what the numbers that are out there. This thing, the mortality rate is now half of the 2019 flu, 0.014%, all right? So 0.025 was the, excuse me, 0.024 was the flu of 2019, the mortality rate. And so we have shut down and destroyed an economy. Um, We talk about, um, you know, different things that have circled the globe in years past that have killed over a million people. And we've never had this type of, government control and so when you start trying to connect dots and ask god for wisdom i think it's evil at the core you know um so um i don't know people that know me i'm i'm bullheaded i try to be humble and loving i fall short heck i fall short on some text messages yesterday busting my boys chops (laughs) um but there's something that's not right about this And we have seen it in different states with our religious freedoms being being infringed upon. And the word of God tells me good and evil are always going to be at war. And history, take the Bible out of it. What does history tell us about men wanting outright power and control? America was built very, very differently. Do we have shame in our past and broken ideology in our past? Yes. But the parts of the Constitution that I can understand were written with such foresight for this very day. From everything about free speech to we need to have full control over our firearms. <laughs> so um, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like the Bible says, our war is not against flesh and blood. So yeah. I, I mean, my, my pastor just preached a message about that on Sunday. And it's, and it's you know, as, as more religious freedoms are being infringed upon it's it's becoming more and more uh yeah. it's, it's it's plain to see almost yeah so, yeah uh, the covid thing i mean think about our homeless population here in la if this thing was anywhere remotely close 
you know. to what they've said this sucker is that, that that homeless population will be wiped out yeah there's no social distancing there they live in the most dirty filthiest inhumane ways possible and we've had other plagues break out here in la through the homeless population you know where where's all this the stuff you know what i mean so um it it, it, it just doesn't it's funny the, the national media sells an agenda and then when you dive down to the, the local and state levels you get all those stories debunked. You know, all this stuff that's come out about Florida, you know, in, in the last few days. My family lives in Florida. I got friends and family all over the state. I was on a call, a real estate coaching call yesterday uh, with one of my, my team leads in Ocala. You know, it's nonsense. The stuff ain't true. The ICUs aren't full. The hospitals aren't on waiting list. Doctors aren't overworked. Matter of fact, the doctors have been furloughed because there's not enough work. And everyone's been sent home to starve and steal and kill our, our country and, and our economy. And I'm declaring in the name of Jesus, evil is going to be exposed and it ain't going to happen. But um, the Bible tells some pretty grim stories of history. Our own history, world history, should literally whet people's appetites about what we're starting to see go on in here. And it's scary how many people can't see. And, and, that, and that is is what it is. God's in control. That's what I know. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. And real quick, I want to, I do want to talk about the NFL. You know, they, they have a lot of controversy Yeah. and everything. What do you, what do you think about, what do you think about kneeling? Uh, and it was just, never. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm disappointed in Drew Brees. I love him. He's a great man of God, a great father, an amazing husband, a great leader. He loves black people. He has served the community of New Orleans, which is predominantly black, greater than anyone. I know the city. I know how crooked and messed up it is. I know how great the people are. But I know the politicians of the city. I know the real story behind Katrina. I know how they didn't build the most, rebuild the most poorest parts of the city. I saw what FEMA did. I was there a part of that. And so the evil agenda that screams, oh, we're for you. Nah, they're stabbing the people that need the most help in the back. And so blacklivesmatter.com is evil. They are self-proclaimed Marxists. They want to destroy America, the America that most black people love and appreciate. They want to destroy the family that God created. They are massive supporters of Planned Parenthood that abort hundreds of thousands of black lives every single year. How many Michael Jordans have we aborted? How many Tiger Woods have we aborted? How many Barack Obamas have we aborted? How many cures for cancer have we aborted? Name an area of influence where black people don't dominate. We have great doctors. We have great lawyers. We have great athletes. We have great teachers. We have great philosophers. Black people are a gifted people. And yet evil has set in to try to destroy them. And yet some black people can't get out of their own way. And so I will be a voice for truth. I will be a voice for reason to say, no, 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 you might hate me, but I'm going to stand up for you anyway. I know what abortion does. The problem is people don't know evil. And we're chasing our own desires. We're chasing all these things that we think are good for us. And they destroy us. My mom and dad wouldn't mind. My mom's had two abortions. She'll tell the story of what it did to her. But you've got all these crazy leftist women that need Jesus to satisfy their broken hearted soul that are screaming, if I didn't have my three abortions, I'd never have gotten my career. If I didn't, and they're bitter and they're angry and you can see the rage in them. That ain't peace. That ain't power. That ain't real feminism. That's weakness. That's brokenness. That's shame. That's hurt. That's heartache. Now, some people will call what I just say judgment or judgmental. What I just said is the word of God. I believe people call Jesus judgmental. Most people hated the man. And so I ain't trying to bow to nobody. And I'm never going to bow to this mob. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, if Heath Evans was on a roster in 2020, I wouldn't ever take a knee but I'd have my hand on my black brother next to me and those boys in those locker room, whether they hate me or love me would know that I stand for them. 
and my charity work would still be diving into the black community to save sexually harassed or sexually abused little boys and little girls that were mostly affected in black communities, they'd see my life. They might hate my stance, but they'd see my life and know, nah, he means business. He might not agree with the whole police brutality issue. He might not agree because I'm a numbers guy. Yeah. I, I like to deal. What can we, I, I, my feelings do not matter. My emotions do not matter. I, 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 I have, I've overbalanced that in my life, and so I'm having to go back with Ava and Naomi and say, no, your feelings matter, but we can't live off our feelings. Your emotions matter to your daddy, because my emotions matter to my heavenly father. My feelings matter to my, my heavenly father. They matter to God. The word of God tells me that I don't have a Messiah. I don't have a Jesus that, that can't understand my emotional heartache and my emotional pain. So I want Ava and Naomi to come to me. I want people to come to me and share their feelings, but I want to be around the people that really want truth. My feelings, my thoughts, they've screwed up a lot of people, including myself. My wants, my desires, my right way of thinking, my way has effed up a lot of things in my life. And so I, I'm, not, I'm trying to, what are the numbers? What are facts? The facts are we, we had 10 unarmed black men in 2019 killed by cops. Eight of them went through the, the system, and from what I can tell, they, they were cleared and rightfully cleared. The other two are in jail. In the numbers of, of <laughs> unarmed or, or cops that were killed, people don't want to deal in those numbers. And so I'm not here to argue ideologies and, and stuff. I'm here to, to say, what is, what's the truth? And it's always going to go back to a heart that did, need to be healed by God, period, the end. And so I, I wouldn't, Drew should have come out and apologized like this. I'm sorry for being so aggressive in my stance. I love my boys. I love my teammates. I love the black community. And I believe my life is gonna to continue to show that I truly love people. But I believe in this country. I believe in this flag. My grandfather's fought for this. I know we might see it different and that's okay. I'm gonna let you see it your way. Please let me see it my way. I'm gonna honor you in other ways, but I'm gonna honor the flag the way that I believe I'm supposed to. I'm going to honor the legacy of my grandfather the way that I believe he would want me to. And then let's just agree to disagree. Yeah. But the mob is never satisfied. Yeah. Their power wants more power, more power, and more power. And guess what? The people that's given to the mob, they're going to be the first one to realize, holy crap, yeah. we got bamboozled. Because they're going to be the first one. Listen, people talk about internment camps and all the other stuff. How did, how, how did Nazi Germany happen? How does Hitler get 6 million people to bow the knee? It wasn't, oh, just one day everyone was just brainwashed. No. It was systematic, just like this is. And so it is what it is. History repeats itself. Yeah. I, Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Okay, wake up, America. We're so prideful and arrogant. You think it can't happen to us? The Bible says otherwise. Sorry, I know that was heavy. No, bro, bro, I, bro, this was this. <laughs> bro, I'm, I'm just sitting down here, man. I'm just like, and I'm like, wow, bro. This this was, man. I know a lot of people are going to be impacted by this for sure. Thank well, you. Let me, add, let me add one more thing to the to the pro life thing that I said. My heart for pro life doesn't start with the baby; it starts with the mom because of my mom. So I'm willing to, to stand up and be a voice that says, no, ma'am, yes, I want that baby to live because I do love black people. And I do think we've aborted five other Michael Jordans. And I believe we've aborted, you know, three other Barack Obamas. And I believe maybe just the cure for cancer, the cure for AIDS or all the, yeah, it probably was going to come by a black man. Think about it. I've talked about Denzel Washington. Like you can talk from politics to doctors, to poetry, to singing, to the arts, to the entertainment. What don't black people dominate in and do extremely well and yet they're 13% of the American population? If we wouldn't kill hundreds of thousands of them every single year by evil KKK birth Planned Parenthood, yeah. they'd be 40% of our population. And we'd probably be much more like this, unified in much more ways. We'd be diversified in more ways. And, and because evil had been thwarted in the womb, 
we'd see more peace and power on this earth. Anytime evil is cut off, there's more prosperity and joy and peace and power to come. The more we allow evil to thrive, the more division, dissension, hatred, everything that's the opposite of what we want is empowered to thrive. And so any woman that's ever going to listen to this, please don't think Heath is hateful. My heart is for women. Like any woman that's the most painful thing about what went down at, at NFL Network was every other woman in the place defended me. But I had one broken, hurting woman that I still love and I've chosen to forgive that told a story about me and 14 other guys. And she got paid. She took advantage of the system. I'm not bitter against her, but it was an insult on my character about how I love and, and want women to be empowered and treated. Every woman in that place went to my defense, but it didn't matter because evil had to be squashed and evil had to be covered up at the NFL instead of divulging what really happened, calling out, no, there was evil here, evil here, evil here, but no, him and him and him, they were, they were clean. And so um, I don't ever want a woman to feel like I'm taking their voice. It's the opposite. I mean, listen, I, I, got, a, I got a lady running built ready for me right now, right? Because I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm really good at one and a half things, all right? And, and I'm going to stay put in, in what I do. So um, I want women to feel loved and championed. Um, I think the Bible champions women. I think the Bible says how perfectly God made them, but I want their hearts to be protected. And evil policies have pushed them to damaging their own hearts. And there's just nothing more beautiful than life. I yeah. mean, well, I'm mess with one of my daughters. And I'll, I'll show you how much I, I uh, champion life. <laughs> well, Heath, thank you so much, man. Where, where can people find out about you on social media? Thank you. They need to hear what you got to say. At Heath Evans 44 on, on all social accounts. Um, and then built, builtready.com. You know, it is a, a platform for men that want to master manhood. A bunch of men that are flawed and far from perfect, but we're doing life together. Crazy killer workouts that are going to work every single time. There's no three by eight, you know, muscle and fitness promise you a good body by not doing any work. We do the work, we put it in, um, and um, just men doing life together. Heath, this, was, this has been an amazing interview. You know, I'm, I'm just sitting back here just trying to absorb everything that you said. And, oh, my God, man. I mean, this is, this is uh, I'm kind of speechless, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and I can't wait to get back working out with you soon. And, and God, thank you so much for being on the show. All right. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Heath. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Please share this. Go, go follow Heath. Go interact with his stuff, guys. And we'll see you next time. Hey, guys, if you liked today's episode, do me a huge favor. Go ahead and leave a comment below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave me a review and tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we share today. Really appreciate it. God bless.